Hi everyone, and welcome again to Nil, the go-to place to learn about business, finance, economics, and much, much more. Please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click that bell notification button below so that you never miss fresh videos and tutorials you might be interested in. Many thanks to our current Patreon supporters and YouTube members for making this video possible, and we'd also greatly appreciate if you consider supporting us as well. So please check the link in the description or click the join button below for more details. My name is Saba, and today we're investigating a relatively niche yet very important concept in financial econometrics and beta measurement that is interval and effect bias, or interval and effect for short. And it involves the differences that you may encounter in estimating betas of stocks at various frequencies. And uh, it can be thought of as a particular case of bias variance trade-off, but it is particular for beta estimations for stocks with very market depths. And uh, it has a lot to do with an optimal frequency at which you might want to estimate a beta for a particular asset. You can estimate uh, stocks beta against some benchmark or some market index at a daily frequency, at a weekly frequency, at a monthly frequency. Different uh, implementations, different software have different default specifications. For example, something like Bloomberg would prefer weekly estimations. Some other practitioner software tools might use monthly as a default. Uh, if you are doing some algorithmic trading implementation, you might be wondering why not choose the most high frequency option available. Well, this video is an answer to all of these questions. Why uh, various implementations might be desirable. Here we have got a very simple example with data uh, since uh, year end 1999 until year end 2021. We've got daily, weekly, and monthly data for three assets. Two uh, US stocks, a very well established and liquid stock, that is Coca Cola, and uh, a smaller, more obscure stock, which is United Therapeutics. You might have heard of it, you might have not. It is uh, a relatively small cap or low mid cap stock, just for the reference. That means that the trading in the United Therapeutic stock is less liquid than in Coca Cola and the market is relatively shallow, has less depth than the market in Coca-Cola, as well as the US market index, which is here the SPDR uh, ETF, uh, SPI ticker, which is a very commonly used proxy for the market benchmark. So first, let's calculate simple daily returns, dividing total return index today by the total return index yesterday and subtracting one for Coca-Cola, United Therapeutics, and the market, enforcing it throughout the sample. Then we can just copy these and calculate weekly returns using weekly total return index data, as well as the monthly data over here. All of the data comes from Yahoo Finance, and it's quite easy to specify a query, downloading your total return indices or closing prices at daily, monthly, or weekly frequency. This should not be a problem. What is the focus of our today's video is to estimate the betas and compare them, especially keeping in mind that Coca-Cola has a much higher market depth, much higher liquidity than United Therapeutics. So for the daily beta, we estimate the slope function for our daily returns here against daily market returns over here, locking the column for the market returns. That allows us to just drag this formula across and calculate the beta for United Therapeutics we see a Coca-Cola has a beta of 0 0.456 against the beta of 0 0.76 for United Therapeutics. And then we can perform the same procedure for our weekly returns as well as monthly returns. And we lock market returns regardless so that we can drag it across and calculate the beta for our second asset without much hassle. And we can see already here that while we have more than 5,000 data points for daily data, we've got slightly above 1,000 for weekly data and only around 250 for monthly data. That constitutes the bias variance trade-off in our estimations. The higher the frequency, the more observations you would have over the course of the same time period. So over 20 years, you have got 
5,000 days, but only around 1,000 weeks and only around 140 months, which means that, in theory, your daily beta would be much more of a precise estimation than weekly or monthly. However, there are some underlying biases that are most prominent if you compare the beta estimations and how they change depending on the frequency for Coca-Cola, which is a very liquid stock, and United Therapeutics, which is much less liquid. We see that daily, weekly, and monthly betas for Coca-Cola do not differ much. They are all in and around 0.55. The differences are quite small. However, for United Therapeutics, the differences are quite material. The difference between a daily beta and a monthly beta is 0.76 and 0.58. That can correspond to quite massive changes if you use this beta to calculate cost of equity, for example, for corporate finance implications, or for something like a dividend discount rule. That can be a difference between uh, holding the stock, buying the stock, or selling the stock. So this is quite material. And you might wonder, well, why and what is the reason for this particular difference? And that has a lot to do with a market friction and uh, time delays in terms of information dissemination. Because Coca-Cola is a very salient stock. A lot of people trade it all the time, which means that whenever there is a market-wide event, for example, a sell-off or an increase in bullish sentiment, this uh, spill over to Coca-Cola almost immediately. Whereas it would take further time, it would take more time for this market-wide action to carry on forward to smaller stocks or less liquid stocks such as United Therapeutics, which means that some of the adjustments that we see, for example here, the market plunged by 1%, and we might see this plunge uh, almost immediately carried forward to Coca-Cola, that might take more than a day for this adjustment to take place in United Therapeutics. What is also quite common for less liquid stocks are days uh, that have no trading activity at all because for the price to change for the market to incorporate new information you need both a buyer and a seller to converge in their valuations and negotiate a trade or over an exchange you need an order to be satisfied by a corresponding selling or buying order and sometimes over a, a significant uh, period of time especially if a stock is thinly traded you might have an hour, three hour period, or even a day when no such trades occur and the price does not change, whereas the underlying value could theoretically change, resulting in delays and market friction. That would mean that the beta's estimation on a higher frequency would be biased due to this particular delay. And that corresponds to the fact that the mismeasurement occurring in beta's for uh, less liquid stocks at very high frequencies would be massive. So if you're having something um, of a small stock, um, less liquid, thinly traded stock, you would generally opt for estimating its beta on lower frequency, uh, making peace with the fact that this estimation might be on a smaller sample and be a little bit noisy. So for example, for United Therapeutics, you would do a monthly beta calculation, whereas for very liquid stocks, there is little um, going against estimating beta on daily frequency or perhaps even on a higher frequency like hourly data. For something like an S&P 500 stock, that would be worthwhile. And that is the core of the argument of Cohen et al. in 1983, the paper that pioneered the interval and effect bias. And uh, it has a lot of implications for any um, financial economics, econometrics, or investment management model that utilizes beta for some uh, input. For example, as I already mentioned, dividend discount models, uh, asset pricing, estimating cost of equity. So whenever you're estimating beta for a security, make sure you take into account the nature of its trading, its liquidity, and the size of the stock. The interval in effect is much more pronounced for smaller stocks, so whenever you're dealing with those, uh, be sure to avoid using very high frequency data, especially when a lot of the returns that you see are zeros. And that's all there is for interval and effect bias in beta 
and its rationales. Please leave a like on this video if you found it helpful. In the comments below, I'm eager to see any further suggestions for videos in business, finance, or economics you would like me to record. And please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and consider supporting us on Patreon. Thank you very much, and stay tuned.